I said something that can be a little provocative if you're if you're semi-churched or been around religion, you think, I can't believe the guy just said not to let not to take that. Isn't that exactly what we're here for? That's a misunderstanding of communion in much the same way that baby dedications and baptisms are often misunderstood. This is something that was very, very serious to Jesus. I want to walk you through a passage in Matthew chapter 26. This is Jesus now at the Last Supper, knowing that he's about to go to the cross. To die on the cross to take the sins of the world upon himself, that he might extend the gift of grace and to those who would accept the gift of grace. And this is what's important. You see, the fact that Jesus went to the cross and rose again did not give eternal life to everybody. That's what's known as a universalist position, that the reality of Jesus equals everybody goes to heaven. That's a lie from the pit of hell, and it goes against everything that God's word says. God's word said that Jesus died so that you could have eternal life, but you have a part to play. You have to accept Jesus as your Lord and your Savior. And what that requires in part is a total surrender of yourself to embrace what it is to be a slave for Christ. To those that would say yes to Jesus as Lord and as Savior, he said this, while they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. Please don't do it yet. I just want to give you context. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, of the promise, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. You see, it's not unless you've accepted Christ as your Lord and your Savior, that this applies. If you've rejected him, then don't mock him now by taking communion. If you're not sure, and it's not about bad intentions or ill motives, then wait until you are sure. To those of you who have acknowledged and laid down yourself to pick up and embrace God's grace, then I say to you now, as Jesus said to his disciples, take this bread and eat of it in remembrance of the broken body on the cross for you and for me. And again, if this is unfamiliar to you, it's going to sound a little gory. But Jesus said as a symbol, now take this juice and drink of it in remembrance of the shed blood that I poured out for you, that upon your receiving me as Lord of your life, you then can have eternal life. Remembering my spilt blood for you, take this cup and drink of it. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. That's exactly what communion is. It's a remembrance, an acknowledging, a promise to never forget who Jesus is and what he did. If you find that a little repulsive, a little unnecessary, a little over the top, then you don't get it. And I'm thanking God that you're here because this is the place to get it. Amen? Worship team, if you'll go ahead and find your way. We're going to start this morning. I'm going to start this morning with a little clip. And I pray you'll see how this all ties in. Watch this as we begin and ask God to touch your heart.
story. Might rain. Yeah, might. Could get wet. Could do. How's it over your way? Windy. How's it over yours? Wendy. <laughs> Probably due to the wind. <laughs> Probably. Oh, if that young man down there doesn't watch what he's doing, he's going to get in a lot of trouble. Oi, Tim, you dozy idiot. Put your hard hat on before I have to come down there and knock your block off. I tell you, that boy is depriving a village somewhere of an idiot. Why don't you ever go to him? I don't know. Guess it's just not worth getting all worked up about. Oh, look at her. Oh, look at that. Mark. Mark, look. Are you okay? Yeah. Why? Well, it's not like you to miss a chance to yell at someone or stare at a hot chick. Where? Oui. <laughs> I've uh, noticed a change in you. Yeah? Yeah, you're not as grumpy as you used to be. You reckon? <laughs> yeah. So what's happened? I guess I've changed. There's got to be more to it than that. I've been to church. <laughs> <laughs> Wedding. <laughs> nah. Funeral. <laughs> nah. Christening. Nah. Were you lost? <laughs> nah. Were you drunk? <laughs> nah. Then what were you doing in a church? I got invited. By who? By a mate. Did you like it? Yeah, it wasn't bad. You should have come to my church. What church? My church. I go to church every Sunday. I don't think you can call the pub your church. <laughs> nah, I go to church, mate. The whole preacher thing? Why, and the praying? Yeah. Um, I'm a Christian. <laughs> you! Yeah? <laughs> Since when? Since seven years ago. Well, how come you never told us about it? Well, guess I was just waiting for the right time. Is that now? <laughs> no. 
Je? Are you sure? What do you mean am I sure? Well, I don't claim to be a scholar or anything, but the way that you yelled at Tim before. And the way that you stared at that hot chick. Oh, everyone's human. But aren't you married? And what about all the sickies you pulled from work? Mm. You know, and the stuff that you've taken from work. I was only borrowing that. But I've never seen you return it. <laughs> me neither. You know, it seems to me, Frank, that being a Christian is the same as being a non-Christian. What do you think about that, Andy? Oh, well. <coughs> Saved by the bell. <laughs> or are you really saved? All right, so funny, maybe, depending on which person you relate to on the scaffolding, right? Well, I want to welcome you to the bridge, and we're at a halfway mark through the book of Revelation. And as I said to you earlier, we're going to take a little bit of a detour, and I'll explain why. Last week, as we finished up chapter 11, I brought you to the passage in verse 18 where it said, It is now time to reward the servants, the saints, and those who reverence God's name. It also said, at the end of that verse, it's time for God to begin destroying those who are destroying the earth. And we said that was not an environmental passage. That was about those who were taking people away from Christ and hurting the cause of Christ. Now I ask you, as you look at that passage, did you see a servant? Did you see a saint? Did you see somebody who was learning to reverence God's name? And did you see somebody that was destroying the efforts to build the kingdom? The odd thing is, and here's where I get personal, the one that was destroying the kingdom was the only one that claimed to be a Christian. Whoa. Let me say it again. The only one who was destroying the kingdom was the only one who was calling himself a Christian. Now that's some weight. As I prayed through this, God led me to a place where we are now going to embark on a mini-series inside a series. Because you see that passage in Revelation 11, verse 18 began to stir in my heart after we left last week. And God said to me, you've shown them the truth, you've explained the truth, but I'm afraid too many people still don't get it. It's one thing to say that those who are God's servants, those saints and those who reverence God's name will receive his reward. And those who destroy the kingdom will feel his wrath. But I think too many people sit and assume that they're in the good place and may not realize that they are perhaps in the bad place. And I think there are people who sit and want desperately to be in the good place but don't fully understand it. And what God said to me is help them to understand. This opening video to me does a great job of creating a context and a framework around those who would be the servants, the saints, and the reverence crowd of Christ's name and those who would do the destroying. You see, it's obvious when you see the atheist and the angry, radical, Islamic terrorist to say, yeah, they're tearing down God's kingdom. It's not so obvious when you see the person who carries the banner for Christ and takes it down into the mud, not to go save and to help, but to discredit and disqualify the cause in the name of Christ. So I say to you now, we're going to take a number of weeks in the midst of Revelation to go into a series that I've entitled, Do Loss, 
servants of God. Doulos, that's the word that Jesus used. That's the word throughout scripture that speaks to what it is to be the true Christian. And if we're going to hold up a passage in a verse like Revelation eleven eighteen, 18, I think it's only fitting. I think I have an obligation to you. I think we as a body need to understand what it is to be those who are going to receive the rewards and those who are going to receive the wrath of Christ. And so I take you now on a journey for probably somewhere around five to eight weeks where we'll take a close look at what this do loss really is. And so I say to you this morning, let's start off by taking a look at a couple of key words. Do loss is the obvious one. But I'd say this to you, you can't really get into an understanding of what God's word says about being a servant or a do loss for Christ unless you first understand another Greek word, kurios. Kurios is the Greek word that you'll find in your Bible most of the time where you read a large capital L, Lord. Where you see Lord in your Bible, most of the time it's going to have this word kurios in the Greek. It's the number one Greek term for Lord. In John 13, 13 and in Jude 4, you're going to see Jesus makes it very clear that that's him. This idea of Lord or Master, it's defined with absolute power, absolute authority over somebody else. You need to know this too, because many times in today's culture, people don't like the true gospel. So we have a church community and a culture within Christianity that's trying to water things down and, and put some, some lipstick on things to make it look more attractive and sprinkle a little sugar around it. I want you to know that this word kurios as well as doulos, these are slave trade terms. Both. The Lord or the master component that's used here throughout Scripture. It's associated with what we would call the slave trade, the slave environment. Things that today in our culture we would say, ooh, you, know, you don't go there, that's politically incorrect. You don't use that as an analogy? What are you, an idiot? You know what people are going to do when you start talking about slaves and masters? That is the context of these words. Lord, in your Bible, speaks to the slave trade component of total ownership over somebody else. In John 13, 13, Jesus takes this title for himself. Jesus says that I am the Lord. In Jude 4, Jesus says, not only am I the Lord, I'm the only Lord and Master in the lives of my children. Whenever the word Lord is referenced in Scripture, there's a slave in relationship to him. Oh boy, I don't know that I like where this is going. Let me tell you about the other word, that's doulos. Again, it's a slave. It's different than a servant. Most of our English Bibles translate servant. That doesn't do it justice. A doulos is more than a servant, more than somebody who's willing to work on behalf of somebody else. No. A doulos has no rights. A doulos is owned. Think about that. Do you feel owned by Christ? Or is he just renting you for a few hours each week? Before you think I've gone overboard, let me tell you this. In the Greek, there were over six words that could have been used for servant. They're not in your Bible. Doulos, slave, is in your Bible. It's not like, well, that was the closest word, so in the translations they kind of bumped it up. Not so. Six different Greek words in their culture and in their time in the language that could have been used for servant. In fact, the English word deacon is one of them. It comes from the Greek that represents serving people with a good heart. That's deacon. Doulos is what was used intentionally throughout Scripture. You see, a servant has a relationship that is optional. A doulos is owned. Note the difference. You see the difference day in and day out. We see it across our culture. We see it in the con context of Christianity. There are a lot of part-time servants for Christ. It's not very often that you'll find the slaves, especially those with a joyous smile, the blessed slaves. We see in Matthew 6, 24, Jesus says, and most of you are familiar with the passage that will say that you cannot serve two masters, 
That's a lousy translation. The literal translation is that you cannot be a slave to two masters. You see, we read that you cannot serve two masters, and you think, well, I've, I've got two jobs. I, I, I most certainly can. That's not very realistic. But when you think of it in terms of a slave, you cannot be a slave to two masters. A slave is owned by one. We see it again in 2 Peter 2.1. We're told that our master, Jesus, bought us with a price. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. So you are not your own. If you're going to be a child of God, if you take the term Christianity and say, that's me, God's word says you are not your own. You were bought at a very, very high price. You were purchased with the blood of the Lord. We celebrated communion together. We remembered that truth together this morning. That's what that was about. When you take communion, what you're doing is you're saying, I am not my own. I remember that I am not my own, that I was bought with a price, a broken body on a cross and spilt blood on my behalf, that my sins would be borne upon his shoulders, and that by accepting him as Lord and Savior, I could have, through faith, the gift of grace and eternal life. See, these things aren't, they're not very popular. But we see in 1 Corinthians 12, 3, Jesus is very, very, very clear. As Paul tells the Corinthians, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is kurios. Jesus is the owner of your life if you call yourself a Christian. To be a Christian, you must be owned. You must be a doulos by definition to be a Christian. See, the lordship of Jesus Christ, it's the single defining component. It's the foundational truth to all of Christianity. Think about that. If you want to boil Christianity down to one thing, what is, what is at the very core of everything? It's that Jesus is Lord. Everything else comes out of that truth. Which means that if he is not your Lord, if you do not embrace the doulos relationship to Jesus as kurios, you're not a Christian. You might be real familiar with Christianity, but outside of total surrender, now that doesn't mean that you know everything, it doesn't mean that you're fully mature. What it means is that you have the want to of a warrior, and that you've got the commitment to lay down self. You must embrace the truth of being a doulos. You do not have a curios if you are not a doulos. And the fact that Jesus is Lord, if you're not his, it doesn't help. Romans 10.9, it's what I have on the back of my business card, brings this truth to the very foundation. It's why I put it on my card. To me, if I can share only one verse with people, it's this one. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord, if you confess that Jesus is my curios, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, thereby proving that he is the Christ, you will be saved. See, no lordship living, no lordship living is in the process of totally discrediting Christianity while simultaneously denying Christ. And I don't care what the lips say. Non-lordship living is discrediting Christianity and denying Christ all around us every single day. I want you to know that Jesus never shed away from declaring his sovereignty. He never backed down. He demanded total, unconditional surrender. And to those who would negotiate with him or give him yeah buts, he sent them away. He said, I have given you the truth. I have paid for your ticket with my blood. I will not negotiate from here. Many of you that know your Bible know that when the rich young ruler came and said, I've done everything. I've got the best resume in the world. I just have this one thing in my heart that I'm holding on to that I value more than you. Nothing else, just one thing. And it's not a bad thing. Jesus said, Lay it down. Follow me. That's what it takes to be my child. 
And when he chose not to and walked away, Jesus did not run after him like a used car salesman and say, hey, hang, hang on, hang on, let, 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 let me go talk to the boss. We can work something out. He let him walk away. Sad but real truth because the standards that God has set are non-negotiable. They've been bought with too high a price. They will not be cheapened. Say, whoa, we're firing up the engines now, aren't we? Well, again, let me remind you, this is a love letter. This is a message of love because if you're going to be told we're at that point in Revelation 11, 18, where it's time, it's a done deal. We're going to reward the servants, the saints, and those who reverence God's name. So listen, if this is you, praise the Lord. You're thinking, great, throw the party. Let's go. Come, Jesus, come. If you're not, maybe this is the love letter that perks your interest and says, I don't know about this whole Christianity thing. I better check it out. I feel like God's knocking at the door of my heart. Praise the Lord. That's a love letter waking you up. If you're a counterfeit Christian who's playing games, who's trying to take the stamp and the title without living the life, then maybe this is the wake-up call that says to you, listen, this is not about some Southern Baptist preacher getting honorary. This is a love letter that says you better wake up because as Revelation eleven eighteen 18 says, it's time. And when that door closes, it's closed. Say, this whole thing is ugly. You know, I don't like the conversation of slaves and all this. Let me let you in on a little secret. The conversation, the dialogue, the, the environment of slavery, it wasn't pretty back then either. Nobody wanted to be a doulos in their day. That's part of what made Jesus' message so radical. He knew what he was saying. It's not like back in their day it was acceptable. In fact, in their day, the Romans were known to be heinous owners of slaves. To be a doulos in a Roman environment was probably a horrific reality. And yet Jesus chooses those terms. Not because it was pretty, I want you to know the true gospel, it wasn't attractive back then either. And if you want to hold on to self and sin, it's not going to be attractive to you now. There's nothing new under the sun, the Bible says. That's truth. I want you to look very, very closely as you spend time with God in the Bible and as you read and as we go through this morning. You're going to see something. Jesus was not a salvation salesman. He was not selling salvation. Okay? I've spent a lot of time as a salesman. I know how to spin. I could put lipstick on the worst pigs in the world. Jesus was not putting lipstick on pigs. I think of it this way. Jesus was fishing for men with the nets of truth, and he would not go out and use bait. Think about that. Think about those who say, well, you know, if you just do a little bit more of this, I might, uh, I might be interested. You know, if you just sweeten the pot for me a little bit that way, I might take another step. Well, you know what happened at that last church? You know what they did to me? You know what they didn't do to me? Me, 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 I, 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 I. Jesus doesn't use bait. Jesus fished for men with truth. With nets, not bait. Now you say, what's wrong with bait? The way I put it is, what's wrong with the feel-good gospel? What's wrong with churches and ministries and friends and neighbors that will tell you, hey, listen, it's, it's okay. It's, God wants you to be happy. You know, God wants you to leave with, with a bounce in your step and, and always thinking, hooray. You know, it's, it's like time for a group hug. There are times for group hugs. But Jesus is not calling you to a life of happiness. He's calling you to a life of servitude. He makes it very clear throughout Scripture. You see, we want, we want the Pollyanna Christ that isn't the real Christ. Read his words. Take what he says to heart. I'm going to ask you to do something crazy, and that is obey what he says to do. Take him seriously when he says something. We have a world today where the concept and the truth of a master-slave relationship has all but jettisoned the church because people don't like it. Well, guess what? I don't think Jesus liked the cross either. But he did it. He's calling us to a relationship 
that puts ourselves in the ground to be totally surrendered. And it's not that we're getting the raw deal. <laughs> He's saying, if you will lay down self and pick me up, let me pick you up, you're going to find that you just traded in a bunch of old pennies for some thousand dollar bills. You're going to get the deal of a century. See, we talk about a relationship. Churches talk about having a personal relationship sometimes. Our liberal wing of Christianity doesn't even do that anymore. But in the evangelical movement, there will be churches that will talk about having a personal relationship with Jesus. Well, that's great, but it's incomplete. Satan has a personal relationship with Jesus. We've talked about it before with, well, you have to believe. Listen, Satan and his demons believe. They just don't have a saving faith. So when we talk about you have to have a personal relationship with Jesus, Satan has a personal relationship with Jesus. But it's not a saving relationship with Christ. That saving relationship is not talked about a lot because it's a master-slave relationship. According to God's word, not mine. Think about all the heresies that are out today. The health and wealth gospel. Those that would lead people astray. How much would be fixed if people would just accept the truth of a curios, do loss relationship? It fixes so many things. Well, you know what I want? Sorry, that question's not allowed in this realm. How about I want what Jesus wants? That's the question. That's what's natural in this kind of a relationship. See, we've got to let the Bible speak for itself. Too many people are looking at the world saying, hmm, how do I make this fit into that? Well, guess what? This will drill a hole right through that. It doesn't need your help. Certainly doesn't need any editing. Lord, help you, Scripture says, if you water it down or change it. The feel-good gospel is telling the world, Stay right where you are. I'll bring Jesus and his standards down. Don't you worry about coming up to his. I'll go talk to the master. And you're going to like this. I'm going to see to it that the master starts listening to the slave. Because that's what you'd prefer. Doesn't ring true when you understand what God's word really says. Now I can make it sound great. If I want to fill this room up with a few thousand people. Problem is Jesus didn't call any of us to build a crowd. He called us to be a church. The church is built on the truth and the love of Christ. Let me show you something that's pretty interesting. I found this in my studies. The parallels between being saved and being a slave. The true parallels between the world of redemption and the world of slavery. You realize that both have to be chosen. Both have to be bought with a price. Both are owned by somebody else. Both are subject totally to the master's will. Both are totally dependent upon the master. Both are accountable. Both will be evaluated. And both will, one way or the other, deal with discipline or reward depending on their actions and the lives that they live. Not what they say with their lips, but what they live with their lives. I don't think it's an accident that Jesus chooses this symbolism all throughout his teaching to drive home this point. It is at the very core of what it is to be Christian. Say, I don't know about that, Pastor. Again, you're going off on the deep end. Well, let's see what Jesus said himself, will we? Would you walk with me? Jesus said this. He said, this master-slave analogy, I'm going to use it all throughout my teaching. I'm going to use it at the foundational level of almost all of my parables. You're going to find this at the very core of what it is to be mine. Matthew 25, 21 is where we see the very familiar passage that you've probably all heard. We all want to hear someday, well done, good and faithful servant. Two things. It's not servant, it's slave. It's those that translated the word didn't feel like most of us could handle that. But the literal translation is well done, good and faithful slave. The context of that is Jesus says, here's a story where somebody's given five pieces of gold, five talents, somebody's given two, and somebody's given one. 
The one that was given five went out and spent their life investing what God gave them and doubled it, multiplied the blessing. The person that was given two did the same thing. They were told, well done, good and faithful slave. As a side note, the one that produced nothing was cast out. Was told that they would be separated forever. We're called as a part of being a doulos, not to just sit on the sidelines and be willing to do what we're told. We're told to be proactively investing in the kingdom of God, multiplying what we have for Christ. Jesus never watered down his call for total surrender either. He preached to crowds, but he never catered to or condoned what was happening in the crowds. Luke 14, 25 and 26, he says this. He gives you the most radical statement in all of Scripture, that you have to hate your family and everybody else if need be, in contrast to loving Christ. If you are pulled away from Christ, he says, you may have to go to the point of doing outrageous things, even with your most tight loved ones, if they become a wedge between you and me. That's where he says, go. If you want to be mine, you're going to have to be willing to walk away from anything and anyone and pick up your cross and follow me. He says in John 6, 66 and 67, many people walked away from him. They loved it when he was feeding them. They loved it when he was giving them the stuff that they received. It's all for me. But as he began to talk about this relationship of servitude, John 6, 66, I think it's ironic that that's the place where it is. The disciples walked away from him, many you say, well, a disciple, I thought a disciple is somebody that's a follower. I bring you back again to the difference between a disciple and a doulos. Disciples can quit. Doulos can't. You can be a devoted follower and then say, yeah, you know, I got enough of that. <laughs> that's a little overboard. I'm not, I'm not looking to get, sign up for the zealot crowd. I've had enough, thank you. I'm going to go someplace where the bar is lowered, where I feel more comfortable. A disciple can quit. A doulos cannot. Now, that's not in relationship to a particular church. That's in relationship to the call of Christ on their lives. Jesus demanded that people deny themselves completely. Deny self completely. He called for total obedience. He called for a willingness to die for him on a moment's notice. These are prerequisites of Christianity. These are not things that you someday decide that, eh, I'll probably go that far. A doulos has no rights. A doulos does not say, I'm not quite sure, Master, if I'm, I'm ready for that. A doulos does. You say, wow, this sounds like a lousy deal. Well, let me tell you, there's another part of the story. True do loss are friends of God. We sang the song this morning. I am a friend of God. Jesus made it very clear. He said this in John 15, 14 and 15. You are my friends. Hear that. If you think this sounds like it's too much or too costly, Jesus says, you are my friends. If. Sometimes those conditional components can be pretty tough. Don't focus on the condition. Realize the reward and thank God for it. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you slave, for the slave does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends for all things I have heard from my father I have made known to you. Here's God's word. He's saying we're friends if you are a due loss. Lay down your life. Pick up my word. You're in the inner circle. We're tight. I love you. We're friends. We are friends. Note that the relationship between obedience and friendship is very real here. If you obey. If you don't obey, if you're spending your time negotiating with God, don't think that this is your promise, because it's not. 
This is for the doulos that obeys the kurios. You will be a friend of God. I want you to also know that obedience does not cause our friendship. It is not the obedience that causes the friendship. Obedience is the fruit of that friendship. None of us are going to earn our way into friendship with God. It's when we love him enough to lay down self and to live that slave-like life. In the fruit of that relationship will be a friendship. It's one of the gifts of God. I also want you to understand that friendship does not in any way nullify authority. Don't think for a second that, oh, see, you get to a certain point and then you're not a slave anymore. No, this is a both-and clause. You will always be a do-loss, but you'll be a do-loss with a smile and a friend. That's the gift. That's the part that the world doesn't understand, that unless God touches your heart, this is never going to make sense. Foolishness, people will say. Words I got, well, you're an idiot. I'm an idiot for Jesus. I'm a blessed, happy do-loss. That's the gift. That's the promise. Not to the religious crowd. You see, the Pharisees had no part of this. Those that were learned and capable of reciting, they get nothing. Because it's not in your resume, it's in your relationship. And your relationship is not going to be measured by your lips, but by your life. Revelation 11, 18, are you one of those do loss slaves for Jesus? Or are you one of those who are destroying the kingdom of God with your life, regardless of what your lips say? Let me just bring you to this other piece, talking about slavery and freedom. Again, two words that don't seem to go together. But Jesus says, God says in his word, my ways are not your ways and your ways are not my ways. There's a very real connection between slavery and freedom in the economy of God. You see, sharing the gospel, sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, embracing the good news of Jesus Christ, we're talking about calling people to slavery. Think about that. We're calling people to slavery. You say, well, not me. My church says that I can have my cake and eat it too. You can have your cake, but you'll leave Christ at the door. True Christianity says that you must embrace the call to be a do-loss. Anything less is to lack the full surrender necessary to receive the gift of grace. Well, then, you know, don't go getting crazy on me there, Pastor Jeff. You know, I can do a lot of good stuff, and I can do church stuff too. And, you know, I'm, I'm a very capable person. I can do both. No, you can't. Again, let me remind you that no one can serve two masters. No one can serve two curios. You got to pick. You're called to a decision. Do you want to be your own curios? You want to be your own Lord and a slave to none? Or do you celebrate and appreciate the gift of being called to be a slave to Christ? That's the key. That's the question. See, Jesus was unapologetic and still very assertive when he was calling people to total surrender. And I say this to you as a people. Maybe this will help you understand me as a person. You have to be Jesus-like when you call people to be Christ-like with their lives. Let that sink in. To be a Christian... To be a doulos is to understand that you have to be Jesus-like in asking people to be Christ-like. And remember, he was never selling salvation. I'll close with this. A quote that came from John MacArthur in a book entitled The Gospel According to Jesus. He says this on page 36. There is no legitimate way to adjust the gospel message to make it sound appealing to people who just admire Jesus but are not prepared to serve him. 
Jesus himself never catered to that perspective. He was not seeking admirers. He was calling followers. And not casual followers, but slaves. That explains why he demanded his disciples' implicit obedience. And when he encountered people who were unwilling to obey unconditionally, he discouraged them from following him at all. Thus, he declared his lordship without hesitation or apology. And he made it clear that the true faith, the true faith in him begins with an unconditional surrender of the sinner's heart. And therefore, the very spirit of saving grace, I'm sorry, the very spirit of saving faith is comparable to the demeanor of a slave. It is a glorious surrender, and it is the supreme joy of every true believer's heart to be Christ's slave. I saw this lived out in a very odd way, and then I heard about a similar encounter both this week. Our daughter Monet had a soccer game early in the week, and we were at the, the ball fields. If anybody's ever been up to Love Point, you know what I'm talking about. Our little guys were playing on the, the playground, and our daughter was playing soccer over on the field. And then there was this number of other families there, but there was this gentleman. And he had a small black, looked like an Australian sheepdog. And this guy had a tennis ball or some kind of ball, and he was firing it as far as he could. I mean, this guy had an arm. He was probably throwing the ball a good 40, 50 yards out into the, into the fields. And this little dog... He would just bang. I mean, just as fast as he could go. He looked like lightning. And he'd charge out and he'd get the ball and he'd come back and he'd be right at the guy's feet and he'd just look and he's so excited. This fellow's had his kids in the park like we did and he grabbed the ball and he threw it. He grabbed the ball and he threw it. This dog didn't stop. And then we noticed something that was pretty cool. He threw the ball, but instead of throwing it where he had been throwing it, he threw it over in another field, way over. And the dog didn't see it. The dog, bam, just like he had been doing. And he's looking all around, and the guy realizes his dog didn't realize it. And this is what the guy did. The dog realized he was being redirected, and he went all the way over to the other field. And it wasn't lickety-split because he was working hard at finding that ball, and he had his nose to the ground, and he was sniffing and going, sniffing and going. And eventually he came back with that ball, just as happy as could be, right at the, right at the feet of the guy. His whole world, that dog's world, revolved around and was filled with puppy joy in obeying his master and doing what his master said. And it was the interaction with the master that brought the joy to this dog. And this was not, here, roll over on your belly and let me pet you. This was hard work and wear you out running. That kind of work with and for the master brought this dog incredible joy. What an object lesson for us. Not if we're pompous and Pope-like and feeling like God gets himself quite a deal that I get myself up in the morning and I go to church and that, you know, I actually do a little something around the church. You know, I'm not all excited and pumped up and filling up in the actual doing of this work because I'm thinking, you know, not a whole lot of folks could do what I do. <clears throat> But if you see yourself the way that dog sees himself, the way a doulos, a blessed doulos, sees themselves in relationship to the most loving Lord, Master in the world, then you'll literally be getting filled up in the process of being poured out. You'll be so thankful that the Master is playing with you, that the Master is using you, spending time with you, You'll be willing, if need be, to turn on a dime. You'll be willing, if need be, to do the hard work of figuring out and just, you know, I got I to gotta do this. I got to do this for, this for the master. This for the master. 
That dog, I promise you, if a cat ran across the field, would not have been distracted. That dog had a mission to serve the master joyfully. If other dogs came out, if a female dog came out, I'm telling you, that dog would not have been distracted. I'm convinced that if somebody took its leg out, it would have found that ball on three legs. What an object lesson for us. You know, God's not calling us to figure out all that needs to happen in the world. He's got everything under control. He is large and in charge. He's got a plan. As you'll see over the next couple of weeks, he doesn't need manufacturers. He needs distributors. He says, listen, I'm going to take care of what needs to be taken care of in the manufacturing department. I just need happy do loss that are willing to be my distributors, the carriers of love and light, the doers of love and light. That's our call. If you want the promise of Revelation 11:18 to catch the reward in heaven, the eternal reward of a servant, of a slave, of a saint, this is the invitation. Over the next number of weeks, we'll go from now looking at what it is in definition and how this lives out and what a blessing it is. You know, being called to this relationship with Christ does not put chains on you. It gives you wings. That's the call of Christ. You're curious if you'll embrace the call to be a doulos for Jesus. Would you pray with me? Lord, we come to you as a people who are humbled. Humbled that you would take the time to, to be personal with us. That the creator of all things would know something as small as the number of hairs on our head that would love us personally enough to die on the cross for each one of us as individuals. That would be intimate enough with each one of us to get personal about our call in life. That would be soft enough to say, call me Abba, Daddy God. Let me carry you when need be. Lord, we come before you today saying thank you. Thank you for the privilege of being your slave. Lord, I don't want to be the Lord of my life. Help us to see, Father, the horror that awaits those who think they're signing up for the paradise of being their own lords. Help them to see the dead end, the eternal dead end that all personal lordship leads to. And I pray in that reality that the beauty of your promise, your love, your gift of grace will rest on the hearts of each one within the sound of my voice. We love you, Jesus. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.